Hello and good afternoon everyone. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Can I acknowledge uh, Seed Estate Director Kyle Murphy. Can I acknowledge my Cabinet colleagues that are here today. The Deputy Premier, Jackie Trad, the Treasurer, Curtis Pitt, Ministers Kate Jones, Leanne Enoch, Mark Ryan, Leader of the House, Sterling Hinchcliffe, Assistant Minister Jennifer Howard, and Member for Bulimba, Di Farmer. Can I also acknowledge the Federal Members of Parliament that are with us here today, uh, to the Mayors, Councillors, Directors General, Vice Chancellors, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your invitation to speak with you today. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the state of our state. In two and a half years of government, we have achieved a lot. But the more we get done, the more we see opportunities to do more, hand in hand with people like everyone in the room today. Let me first pay tribute to the valuable work by CEDAR. There is always a place in our national dialogue for informed and reasonable debate about our economic direction. For my government, that debate goes directly to the heart of the issue that drives us every day, an objective we share with you here today, improving the lives of Queenslanders. From the outset, my government has been determined to restore stability and confidence. There is nothing more important to economic confidence than employment. Last week's ABS data revealed that since my government came to power, more than 115,000 jobs have been created in Queensland. That equates to 3,720 jobs created each month since we took office, well over 100 jobs per day. Trend unemployment is down to 6%. And through our programs like Back to Work and Skilling Queenslanders for Work, we aim to drive it even lower. Queensland's economy has returned to strong growth of 3.9%, well ahead of the rest of the nation at 1.2%, and more than four times the growth rate of 0.8% over the last year of the previous government. Queensland's exports have broken more records, exceeding $68 billion over the year to July, an increase of 52% under my government. Growth in exports has been driven by coal, LNG and crops, more noticeably chickpeas, which have now reached exports of $1.4 billion. It is worth thinking for a moment about the importance and the potential of chickpeas. As India's middle class continues to grow, the world's largest vegetarian population will have an ever-increasing appetite for high-quality protein, an appetite that Queensland chickpeas can help satisfy. Prices for Queensland's metallurgical coal used in steel production are holding up well with spot prices of more than $200 US a tonne. These statistics paint a bright picture of where Queensland is today and outline a path of where we can go as an economically diverse, outward-looking, socially inclusive state. Our future success and all the benefits that go with that depends on all of us as Queenslanders ensuring our state is positioned to take full advantage of changing job trends, changing industries and the changing international landscape. Queensland is the best place to be to take up that challenge. One of my government's signature policies that sets out to do just that is advancing Queensland, a $420 million investment in maximising the state's future potential. To the end of June, we have committed more than $205 million of this investment to 1,650 innovators across Queensland. Their projects are supporting more than 4,500 jobs, and Advanced Queensland is central to our vision to help Queensland open up new frontiers, unlocking the jobs and investment opportunities of the future. We are on our way to being the start-up state. We have overtaken Victoria to now have the second largest number of startups. We have established a startup hub in Fortitude Valley, and there are now 13 incubators in regional Queensland. None of this was around two and a half years ago. This has all happened in this term of government. But let's talk about some of the other new frontiers we're opening up in Queensland. 
Our biofuel strategy, we have cemented an agreement with the US Navy. That great green fleet agreement provides us with a key partner necessary to generate the economies of scale that will give refinery proponents the confidence to push ahead with the development of their plants. More broadly, our biofuels acceleration program is attracting a range of companies to establish facilities, crucially, like so many of these new frontiers, the money and jobs are heading to regional Queensland, places like Gladstone, Mackay and Bundaberg. Companies in varying stages of de development in this exciting industry include Mercurius, Northern Oil, Leaf Resources, MSF Sugar and Amaris. Some of these companies are looking to use Queensland as their stepping stone, as their gateway into Asia markets. There's been a lot of talk recently about investor confidence in the energy sector. I can tell you our message to the energy industry is clear. Our government-owned power assets will remain in public hands and we will continue to push towards our 50% renewable energy target by 2030. I can tell you and Malcolm Turnbull, if he's looking for some advice, the industry has responded to my government's clear energy policy direction. In Queensland, we now have $5 billion pipeline of private investment in renewable energy projects in this state that will support 3,200 jobs and generate 5,000 megawatts of clean energy. The 5,000 megawatts is more than twice the theoretical capacity of the ageing and much debated Liddell Power Station in the New South Wales Hunter Valley. And I acknowledge the representatives of AGL that are here today. In two and a half years, our policy direction has created the environment for large scale solar farms to flourish, from zero generation to projects with a capacity in excess of 1,000 megawatts. Every day, we see more and more evidence that investment certainty is fundamental to putting downward pressure on the power bills for families and businesses, not just here in Queensland, but across the national energy market. Queensland is already Australia's energy powerhouse. We have Australia's youngest and most efficient fleet of coal-fired power genera generators, publicly owned assets that on a daily basis are sending vast amounts of electricity into the national electricity market. According to the Australian Energy Market Operator, Queensland is the only mainland state in the national electricity market that is not expecting a shortfall in electricity generation. I want to see a rewrite of the national electricity market rules because they are outdated and they are unfair. It is unfair that the decision of other states to privatise electricity assets is hurting Queensland power prices, even as the federal government seeks to intervene in those privatised assets. It is unfair that Queenslanders are paying more for electricity because other states are failing to develop their gas basins and their gas reserves. But we're also seeing industry following suit. Companies as diverse as Sun Metal Zinc Refinery near Townsville and Brisbane Airport Corporation are investing in their own solar farms to cut their own power bills, investing hundreds of millions of dollars and generating hundreds of jobs. But perhaps the greatest new frontier within the renewable energy industry is battery technology. A few short years ago, it would have been impossible to conceive of the idea of suburban homes with rooftop PV panels being able to go off the grid with the aid of storage, like the Tesla Powerwall. But today, the technology is real and growing in efficiency and popularity every single day. My vision for Queensland is not simply as a beneficiary of this technology, but as a builder of it, and once again, as an exporter into Asia. That is why we are in talks with proponents and local councils in an effort to attract battery production factories here to Queensland, similar to the Tesla Gigafactory I visited in Nevada while on the United States trade mission earlier this year. With much of the investment in this industry in the Sunshine State has been around solar, there are also vital projects in both hydro and wind technology. Today, Cairns Port will be abuzz with the arrival of the towers for the 180 megawatt Mount Emerald wind farm to be built near Mareeba. Next week, the blades for the Mount Emerald will arrive in Cairns. The key investment from government here is underway as well. 
with reinvested dividends from our electricity assets being used by Powerlink to connect these large-scale renewable projects to the transmission grid. Another new frontier for Queensland is the potential of a multi-billion dollar industry with drone technology. At the inaugural World Drone Congress held here in Brisbane recently, we launched Australia's first drone strategy to unlock the new opportunities and overcome regulatory hurdles in this fast-growing industry, which will change our lives in ways which we can barely imagine. For example, drone technology is being used in rescues. It was used just recently when some climbers um, were stranded on the Glasshouse Mountains. It can be used for uh, safety, for people uh, going in after um, uh, damage has been done, like recently at the Inala Civic Centre, uh, to direct where the firemen should go in after the fire. And it's also being used in the film industry as well. In Queensland, another new frontier for us is in defence, where my government is fully behind Rymatel's bid for its boxer vehicle for the defence choice for the Land 400 contract. If successful, there is reason to be confident we stand to create a new industry in Queensland worth billions, built around a military vehicle centre of excellence. We have new frontiers in some of our tra more traditional areas, such as agriculture, our commitment to build cluster fences four and a half times the length of the Bruce Highway in Western Queensland is bringing the sheep industry back. And of course, how can we not mention our new frontier of events? Having secured the TV Week Logies from Melbourne, I like the sound of that, and of course, we're hoping to secure Jeff Horne's first title defence for Brisbane after his resounding success in the Battle of Brisbane at Suncorp Stadium. We've developed a world-first exhibition at Quagoma through Marvel creating the cinematic universe, and in superhero style, 269,000 visitors went through the box office, smashing all former attendance records. Our investment in making blockbuster movies and the first Netflix production in Australia being filmed right here in Queensland has transformed Queensland now into a permanent home for the film and international television industry production. And we're looking to new frontiers as the world changes with life-changing medical innovation, securing a new Johnson & Johnson Innovation Partnering Office in Queensland and the Siemens Healthcare Innovation Centre. And also, let's look at our traditional strengths of tourism, one of our traditional strengths, but once again, helping to power Queensland. Brisbane will now be home base for half of Qantas's fleet of Boeing 787 Dreamliners, $1 billion worth of aircraft capable of reaching further than ever before across the Pacific and bringing 470 new jobs to Queensland. In two and a half years, we have secured 735,000 extra international airline seats to Queensland, the latest of them being the first Brisbane to Beijing direct flights announced earlier this week by Minister Kate Jones. This is not just about the southeast. We've also seen recent announcements of new flights from Hainan and Guangzhou into Cairns from later this year. Together with existing services from Hong Kong, this means that the far north will be getting upwards of 3,500 seats arriving every week from the Pearl River Delta in China. That industrious part of southern China is where 120 million people live in a 120 kilometre radius, with perhaps the fastest growing middle class on earth. There's also good news on the domestic travel front with new national visitor data released today showing nearly a 17% growth in business travel for Queensland. This has helped produce another record-breaking year for domestic visitors to our state. In summary, we are pushing into these new frontiers because new frontiers for Queensland mean new jobs and more opportunities for Queenslanders as we continue to diversify our state's economy. Today I can announce that Brett Godfrey has been appointed as the new Chair of Tourism and Events Queensland. Brett is co-founder and former CEO of Virgin Australia Airlines. He has vast experience in the Australian and Queensland tourism markets 
and will be an invaluable asset to the TEQ board. Make no mistake, the place to be is Queensland. I've already spoken about the certainty in our approach to energy policy and now I'd like to address water. My government recently released the Queensland Bulk Water Opportunity Statement. That document identifies 270,000 megalitres of uncommitted water across the state and up to 300,000 of underutilised allocations in eight major water supply systems. This is the first time these vital resources have been comprehensively mapped and so thoroughly audited. But my key message today is that we need to continue to work together. By working together with Queenslanders, we are delivering a better way for Queensland. We do not sack and we do not sell. We build and we invest, and that is working. We have, invest, we have invested in additional infrastructure projects, particularly with local councils, and I acknowledge some of the mayors that are with us here today, to provide extra impetus for job generation outside the southeast corner. My government has made over $15 billion in new infrastructure commitments as part of our $42.75 billion infrastructure program over four years. We are getting on with the job and building Cross River Rail. Make no mistake, we weren't waiting for the federal government, we made the decision in our budget and we will build Cross River Rail, $5.4 billion. We've got $775 million for Works for Queensland and building our regions to support jobs in the regions. $270 million for the second stage of the Gold Coast light rail built under my government where the first trams are now being tested on that second stage. We've invested in our health services and our education services, more than $800 million in additional health infrastructure and more than $2 billion in additional school infrastructure, and an increase of more than $1 billion in roads investment, including the $65 million commitment I announced yesterday to Sumner's Road Interchange, adding to our recent commitments to M1 upgrades and the Walker Stone Bypass. To my mind, Queensland's economic success has always stood apart from others because of our shared understanding that we are all in this together. An understanding that success is shared and that the opportunity must be created for the entire state. A thriving, prosperous economy is one that serves all its people, not one that benefits the few. Right now, Queensland is well positioned to seize the opportunities that are flowing from the Asia Pacific. In a country with the population of Australia or a state with the population of Queensland, it is difficult for us to comprehend the size of the growing middle class of Asia. People in China, Japan and Korea already recognise everything Queensland has to offer as a tourism destination. Many of those people who arrive here for a week-long stay will also give serious consideration to sending their children here for tertiary education. In those three countries, the size of the middle class and the number of people with a passport rises by tens of thousands every single week. And to that growing middle class population and influence of India, a country where we share the English language, the rule of law, a Commonwealth heritage and a great love of cricket. And our state is uniquely placed to develop strong trade relationships across traditional markets like tourism, higher education, as well as our emerging new frontiers. Whether it's tourism, advanced manufacturing, health and education services, biofutures, the film and TV industry or agriculture, we have a skilled workforce, the resources and the location to capitalise on Asia's growing middle class. To meet these opportunities, we are ensuring that from their earliest education, Queensland school students have access to the subjects that will be the building blocks for the opportunities in new industries here and throughout the Asia Pacific. Overnight, former President Obama tweeted about how fun and important coding can be in schools. I think it might be time for us to get the former president back to Queensland so he can see how coding and robotics are already being taught in our schools under my government. I look forward to the day soon when our newly launched Premier's Coding Challenge is as popular as the Premier's Reading Challenge. 
This isn't just an initiative for urban schools, but this is being taught across the entire state. I recently visited the small town of Thierry in the Central Highlands. It was wonderful to see how enthralled the students were with coding and robotics. From early years, coding and robotics are now not only educational, but addictively fun for young students with greater access to STEM subjects than ever before. We are training our students for the jobs of the future. When I addressed CEDA last year, I said that while we have worked tirelessly to implement our economic agenda, we have balanced that with a progressive policy platform that aims to bring Queensland into the 21st century. That has continued over the last 12 months. We've allocated more than $300 million over six years to respond to the Not Now, Not Ever report. That includes trialling new domestic and family violence courts in Beanley and Townsville and specialist magistrates travelling to Mount Isa and Palm Island on circuit. We have developed an action plan on ICE by talking with local communities about the harms caused by the drug ICE. And my government has better targeted actions to disrupt drug supply, reduce demand and to reduce the harm caused by the use of increasing access to treatment and family support services. And in July this year, my government launched a $1.8 billion Queensland housing strategy, recognising how important housing is fundamentally for families across our state. I firmly believe government has a responsibility to create opportunity. It is our job, it is my job, to make it possible for Queenslanders to be in the best position to seize the opportunities in our cities, our towns, our regional and remote communities. For them to have access to quality education for our children and quality and affordable health services for families, no matter where they live in Queensland. This should not come as a surprise to anyone, but I love this state. It goes deeper than an appreciation of the people, the climate and the landscape, although both are amazing. It's about watching Queensland defeat New South Wales in state of origin over and over and over again. It's about the prospect of another all Queensland grand final between the Broncos and Cowboys in a week and a half's time. It's about Jeff Horn taking the WBO welterweight title at Suncorp or the Sunshine Coast Lightning winning the super netball title in their very first year of competition. It's about Sally Pearson fighting back from injury to be world champion again. It's about Ian Fraser pioneering a vaccine that protects teenagers against a cancer that can kill up to 250,000 people a year. It's about Kawanyama Elder, Priscilla Major, reaching out to me, sitting under the big mango tree, talking about significant health issues in her community. It's about Cairns State High School principal Chris Zilm bringing his community together to celebrate 100 years with the state's best orchestra in a state school. A band so big it can barely fit on the stage. We might have to give them a new hall. <laughs> Fundamentally, Queensland is about its people. For all our individual successes, we achieve the most when we work together as a community. Nothing motivates a Queenslander more than another Queenslander in need, as we saw with Tropical Cyclone Debbie. It is a generosity of spirit and instinct, an instinct to offer an open hand to another person going through a tough time. That's what motivates me in my job, people. Governments must address these issues. They must commit and they must deliver. Governments that make promises and break them fuel the cynicism of a disaffected electorate. They usually find themselves punished at the ballot box. That's why I am most proud of my government's record of honouring our election commitments. Of the 553 we made before the last election, 484, or 87%, have been delivered, with another 50 underway. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, when I stood here a year ago, I reflected that we had higher economic growth, lower unemployment, higher confidence, more frontline services, less division, and a fairer, more modern society. 
Today, I can stand here proudly before you and say that we have delivered those fundamental strengths again. My determination is to continue to work for Queenslanders. In a fortnight's time, it will be six months to go until the Commonwealth Games open on the Gold Coast. That event will inject $2 billion into the Queensland economy and showcase our state to an international television audience of 1.5 billion people. In an era of upheaval in traditional alliances and trading blocks, there is a familiarity and certainty that comes from the Commonwealth, our oldest international family. My vision for the Commonwealth Games is about so much more than sport. It is about creating new trade opportunities with a group that makes up one third of the world's population and one that shares those common values I referred to earlier when talking about India. That is why we will have a purpose-built venue, Commonwealth House at Broadbeach, to host trade discussion between Commonwealth nations, looking at investment opportunities as an enduring legacy of the Commonwealth Games. I hope that this time next year, I have the opportunity to stand here again as Premier and describe to you the opportunities that post-games legacy is bringing to Queensland. I want to continue to earn the trust of Queenslanders and make the case that we can get on with the job and keep delivering for Queenslanders no matter where they live. Thank you.